Good morning. Welcome to Hope morning. Community Church. Sorry for the delay for those online. We had an extended worship period and it was awesome. Um, we're going to get started this morning. Um, we are glad you are here with us. We're going to start with a, a scripture reading and Pastor Nathan is going to be speaking on family and friends and part of that I think at least part of one of the verses he had chose to look at um, in John 15 had to do with love. And I think sometimes when you're dealing with family and friends, um, sometimes love can be hard and it can be difficult. And I think 1 Corinthians 13 does a, a good job of saying this is what it should look like and this is what it shouldn't look like. And sometimes we're on either side of this. But um, 1 Corinthians 13, starting with verse 4, I'm going to read through, through verse 13. It says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes... What is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. We're going to move into our communion time, so if those online would get their elements ready, um, I'm going to pray. Um, we're going to focus on God and what he would have us do, um, making our hearts right before him, we do this in remembrance of him um, and the ultimate sacrifice. And during our worship time, Carrie spoke a little bit on the lion and the lamb. And we just got done talking about what love is and what it isn't. And sometimes love can be the lion and sometimes love can be the lamb. And Jesus was both. And um, in our communion time, let's, let's try to remember... Um, who he is, where he's brought us from, and what he wants for us, which is, in love, always the best. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and um, as you uh, are ready afterwards, um, you can make your way, in, in, at least here in the service, there are two stations in the back to, uh, to get to the elements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, so thankful, for the plan. Your plan that was perfect. Your plan for your son to come to give direction to your sheep. To give direction to the lost. To give sight to the blind. To give health to the weary. Father, we're thankful that that plan included all of us that father we have the the gift that all we need to do is accept it accept the gift of your son that we might have eternal life that we might be with you how amazing is that as you set the stars in place you knew us 
hard to grasp. And Father, we, at times, and sometimes it seems that so many times, are not focused, not purposeful in love, and sometimes focused on ourselves. And Lord, may we look at your face. May it shine on us, and may we reflect it as best we can. Open up our hearts to you this morning to receive your blessing through your elements. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So next, um, giving. So there are a couple forms to in order to do that. One is online um, at our hopefrankamuth.org website. Uh, there's a link in the bottom of the page. And, and if you're here in person, we have a basket um, on your way in or on your way out um, that's there um, for giving. And you know, God loves a, a cheerful giver. And it's one of those things that I was reading that passage in 1 Corinthians 13. And we're to love, we're called to love, and I just can't help but put that 
cheerfully love in, in that place. Because if we're reluctantly loving, it's pretty obvious. And, you know, our motive is to be faithful and love and, and to show and to be a reflection of him. And if we're not doing that, people notice. Um, and in this series, Pastor Nathan's talked about different ways in which we can notice, whether it be an aroma or a, a salty taste. There are things that, that sit in people's mind and in their hearts, and, and we should be about um, not reluctantly loving, but loving as he first loved us and, and help that to be part of what we look to and how we act. Um, prayer request. I first got um, a, a letter to read. This is for our whole community family. This is yeah. from Stacy Tyrion and kids. And um, Stacy is here this morning. Um, what a joy to see Stacy and Caleb here this morning. And um, you know, as, as pastors talking about family and friends, that's family, and they are friends, and. Um, uh, we just love them, and, and we're just gonna. I'm just gonna read this note um, from them. It says, "On behalf of Jim, myself, and four and our four kids, thank you so so much for all the love, prayers, encouragement, and tangible acts of service." Um, and it goes through a bunch of different things that that we have done, and I'm not gonna go into to horrible detail, but um, as family. We, we provide and, and we, we, we look after um, one another and those are the things that we did. Um, and the help for his celebration to run smoothly. Sound system, parking, um, serving drinks, refreshments. God has used you all greatly to carry us through this difficult time. Much love, Stacy and kids. Um, thank you for that. Um, prayer request this morning. Um, we've got some, I've got, maybe Nathan's going to be my runner. I will be your runner. Nice. <laughs> um, Ralph Leach, we need to remember him in our prayers. Um, he is rehabbing at Health Source um, from something they say wasn't a stroke. Um, not sure what it is, but there are things that he's having to do now um, with regard to language and occupational therapy. So, Ralph Leach, if we can remember him. Um, Jeannie's mom, uh, Norma Allen, is uh, rehabbing at home. Um, and with her 92-year-old husband. Um, and he's had, let me see, she's had two pins um, for a cracked hip two weeks ago. So she's got um, a lot of work ahead of her, and um, we just need to remember Norma in our prayers as well. But you said at home, correct? Yeah, that was not the doctor's instruction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, she is at home rehabbing, okay. that is correct. Um, I have uh, school start decisions for schools and parents. I can tell you by being a spouse of a teacher, there is, and has been all summer, a ridiculous amount of work going into that. So, so please pray for that. Um, for Stacy and kids, just comfort and grieving, protection and provision, and, and really, you know, wisdom on next steps. Um, as as family, we need to continue to remember those aspects as well. Um, also, you know, what a blessing. Mike Ewing walks in this morning, and I'm like. Dude, what are you trying to do, scare us? Um, he's here this morning. Praise God. Um, Mike had some stints put in, and um, he's feeling better. Obviously, he, he was not in a great place, and um, fortunately, they knew um, to take action. So we need to remember Mike as he continues to um, heal from that. And, um, you know, we've got some others that really are just kind of a continual thing, but we need to remember our partners, uh, Redeemed Children in Hope House Detroit, and um, just really about also how we act and how we um, understand.
understand the spiritual nature of everything that's going on in this world and things around us um, and understand that um, you know we need to be praying all the more as we see these things happening um, God's word said that we would be of sober mind and it doesn't just mean I shouldn't be drunk it means I should be watching for his return may it not surprise us and so as we as we see these things occurring um, we need to be ever mindful of how that fits into our worldview um, anything else any other prayer request Mary? I have a praise we were able to um, get to the cottage we had rented with our kids and grandkids mm. for our usual week and Thomas is in lots of pain and that's a good thing when yes. things are waking up that's awesome <laughs> so yeah we're, we're thankful that Tom is in lots of pain um, <laughs> and, and he's lifting up his hand right now and he's saying yeah I can feel this and you know the significance of that is is that his nerves are starting to work again and it's waking up and so um, praise God for that for sure um, let's go to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father we're so thankful that um, you know things happen you we're not we're not promised that things are going to be easy here we're not promised um, just a, a cakewalk but we are promised that you will be with us and father we uh, we praise you for things that we see like um, Tom lifting up his arm uh, Mary noticing um, pain and, and Tom noticing pain and uh, we praise you that those pathways of nerves um, are coming back. We're thankful that they were able to get with, out with family and do their normal um, retreat with family, even though it's maybe not quite normal. Um, but we praise you for that. We praise you for watching over Mike Ewing um, in the process of him having to have some stints put in. And um, Father, we, we just uh, praise you for watching over Jeannie's mom and we pray that you would continue to do that that, that Norma would um, seek wise counsel that she would um, just stick to therapy um, just a difficult thing Father and then we just pray for, for clarity there and uh, be with Jeannie and, and Nathan as they um, are trying to juggle these things and other family things at the same time and uh, it's, it's, it can be difficult, Father. And Lord, we pray for uh, Ralph Leach that, that you would, uh, Father, just mend things, that, that, that things would be put back in place, that things would be working um, normal to the point, Father, that, that he could see some hope and some light. And Father, for Shirley, that you would just give her strength and peace and understanding on how she should... Um, work and interact and, and uh, um, help uh, Ralph in, in his needs. And uh, Father, we just uh, pray for redeemed children um, as, you know, Haiti has uh, a lot of the same lockdowns and issues and, and people with uh, COVID-19 uh, related struggles. And that's on top of all the other struggles that they have. And Father, we just pray that you would um, make it a light in that country. We pray that you would make um, the area and the, the, the actions, the unselfish actions that Isna has um, towards her people, um, that it would be fruitful, um, it would be multiplied. And Lord, your light, your grace, your love would shine forth through that. And Father, for Hope House, as they... Um, are growing and they are, are involved in more and more things we just pray again that um, they would be a lighthouse in Detroit for your love um, that, that, that kids and adults alike would, would see that there is a God um, that he sent Jesus and that, that they just need to accept that and, and live for him and Father, may that be evident. And Father, we're thankful that um, 
we are here in church this morning and we're thankful for your love we pray that you would go before the rest of this service that it would be pleasing unto you as a sweet aroma that we give ourselves to you and to your service we pray in jesus name amen um, these are some announcements the young adult group is nathan shaking his head at me no okay um i'm getting older so sometimes i just see things um and not hear things but um so they're they're going through uh and discussing the way of the master at this point and so they're meeting still on tuesdays at six o'clock um, this is post high school through 20s Uh, there's a prayer group uh, every Thursday at 6.30 that meets here as well. Um, one of the things I noticed when I drove in this morning, and I didn't notice this, and maybe because we were at church camp last week, but um, it looks like our parking lot's getting smaller. <laughs> and so, you know, we, have, we had heard um, that there were things that were going to start taking place, and they are starting to take place, uh, just so that you're aware of that. Um, outdoor worship service is August 23rd at the Seabolts and uh, at 10 o'clock. So service is at, not at 9.30, at 10 o'clock at the Seabolts, August 23rd. And Believer's Baptism. So if you um, feel that the Lord is calling you to be baptized, um, and we will have time for that to occur um, during our believers baptism at the sea bowls so we're at the share your story time um, does somebody have a story they would like to share this week christina has a story i don't have a story she doesn't have a story So if you plan on coming to the picnic on the 23rd, um, we're trying to get an estimate on food, and in particular meat. So Christina's going to be ordering it. If you could get back with her um, as soon as you can uh, with a, like an RSVP, yeah, we'll be here. She's ordering the, the, it tomorrow. She's ordering it tomorrow. So if you did that today, that would be Facebook much appreciated. Facebook people can just respond to the Facebook. And then there's a Facebook I don't know how Facebook works, but there's something in Facebook where <laughs> you, you can just reply um, to the uh, meeting notice in there. I don't know. Is it a meeting notice? I don't just know. say, I'm coming to the picnic or something. All right. All right. In Facebook, just say, I'm coming to the picnic. It'll work out. Um, I, have a, I have a story, and it maybe isn't a long one, but that's fine. Um, we were done at church camp this last week, and you know one of the things that, uh, while I was reading up on love and and how we are to behave as family and friends, um, you know one of the things that you notice there are there are people that you have been around, and these people that are, are at church camp, we've been around them for years and years, and it, in a lot of ways you don't even notice like oh yeah we've been we've not been together for a year. Because there's certain people you just talk to, and it's just like, oh yeah, well we're doing this, and you're just, they're like-minded. Um, the the spirit is something that binds us together, and and there's always something to talk about, um, and so that's just, it's it's refreshing to to go out into different places and have that occur. Uh, one of the things that happened that there was a pastor the one night. And yeah, this is, I mean, church camp is like two services a day. It's just crazy spiritual. So, um, <laughs> but one of the services, this guy is a pastor in Flint and they're starting a new church and you're like, well, okay. And he, and he even commented on this. Yeah. Like, all right, do we really need another church? And one of the things they're doing, and, and it kind of struck me with this whole idea of love. One of the things they're doing is they, just, they decided um, are, 
we want to go here in Flint. What are the needs? So before their church, I mean, they haven't even met yet as a church. The first thing they did was go into the community and say, what are we looking at? What do people need? And he said it's kind of like the opposite of what usually happens. People get, you get a church building or whatever, and then you just figure, oh, well, here's my people. Now maybe they're doing it ahead of time. And there's a reason why. And, you know, he said part of love is being purposeful. And he said, why not be purposeful right from the very beginning? And it's kind of interesting what they found out. What they found out was is that people, one of the restrictions that people have is laundering their clothes. And you wouldn't think that that's something that precludes them from being able to do certain things. And what they found was is it absolutely does. And so they decided that they were going to get this church, and the first thing they were going to do, and interestingly enough, I think it's actually going to open before the church, but in the basement of the church, they're putting a laundromat in. Because not only do they give a, a space where there's safety, but they're also basically contributing to a, a need that the community has. And this laundry mat's going to open, I think, a couple weeks before the church. Um, but when I thought of love, and when I thought of being purposeful, quite often we're not that purposeful. And, he, and one of the comments he made was, is, is at times when you're that purposeful, you, you really don't have time to think, well, this is what I'd like to see. This is, what I, I, this is how I want it. Right from the very beginning, he was like, no, Let's just see what is the need out there. And so I just thought, from a love standpoint, from a, these are going to be my family members, these are going to be my friends, how do I deal with that? This is, this is what we felt like was best. And to me, that just struck a chord with the whole idea of his motive is so not about himself. And, and really, rightly motivated, that's how we should be going about our day. So that was kind of my short story of what we had seen at, at church camp. I thought it fit with hopefully where pastor's going to go. So at this time, Pastor Nathan, would you come up? Sure. Hey, can you leave that mic right there on the front of the stage? You want to stand or use one of the ground? Just down on the ground. Hey everyone, good to be with you again online and in person. We're in a series, uh, as you know, if you've been with us, called Powerful Pictures, Motivating Metaphors for the Following Jesus Journey. And what's interesting about the way God creatively made our minds, we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and the left hemisphere likes to deconstruct and figure stuff out, break it into its pieces, so like each week we've taken a different metaphor or a group of metaphors that are kind of together and we've kind of broken them down a little bit, tried to think about that metaphor. And the right hemisphere like is looking always holistically and putting things together. So all of these metaphors actually are functioning at the same time and interrelate and support each other. But each week we, we kind of focus on one aspect, if you want to say it. And thankfully, God has given us our, our right hemisphere to, to put all of this kind of stuff together. Um, Jeannie and I have been talking uh, somewhat, and we talk a lot, which I guess is good for a married couple, um, <laughs> about, uh, that relates very closely to the uh, metaphors we're going to look at today, which I would say are the uh, essentially relational nature of Christianity. Family and friends, family and friends. And so the reason I asked Brett to put the mic down there is because one of the things we've talked about is wouldn't it be cool if in our teaching times and interactions, if someone had a question like, well, what about this? Or that didn't really make sense to me, that they would feel the freedom, which she does with me at home for sure, and occasionally, you remember, uh, she'll do it here too, but <laughs> to actually ask the question. 
And I said, well, I am good with it. I just don't know how to get the people to like be good with it. And because you, know, you feel like you're, you know, introducing yourself into the, the, the you're walking on stage, kind of like and interrupting the, the performance, so to speak. But I don't want you to feel that way. So literally, if you have a, a question, uh, something that comes up um, that you've grappled with in relationship to what we're talking about, um, if you come up and stand right there with the mic in your hand, that will be my cue that you actually have a question. <laughs> So then when it fits, then I'll just pause and, and get your question and, and hopefully God will give me some, some words to respond or to say, that is an excellent question that I had never thought about before. Uh, can we come back to that next week? So one or the other things will happen. So as we get ready to get into this uh, metaphor, I want you to think about two, two things. So put on your memory or imagination hat right now. And so I want you to think about your best memory of family or if that's hard to come up with because not everyone had great family stories or your imagination of what that could have been like if you'd actually had a really great memory of family like what would be the dream scenario in terms of just man this is what it's all about this is what it's supposed to be like in regards to family and the second one is, do the same thing in regards to friendship. Your best memories of friendship, your best friend ever, and what you did together, and why it was so meaningful to you to have that person as a friend. Or, if you have a, a, a shortage of those kind of memories, the imagination you might have of what that could have been like at certain points in your life to really have a deeply committed, loyal, faithful friend. I think it's very significant that when Jesus is presenting to his disciples in John 15 a picture of what the Jesus movement will be like and what he wants them to be thinking about and the metaphor or picture to have in their mind about what it is they're, they're signing on to and what it will be like, he uses these two uh, related relational metaphors of it's like the best family you can possibly imagine and it's like the best friendship you can imagine. And so then he, he kind of fleshes it out, which is what this morning's uh, message will be about, is uh, fleshing out the reality of what that looks like. I just called this morning's message, which is number six in our series of seven, um, family and friend, singular, not that it doesn't have the, the plurality component, but Jesus in this section says he is our friend, he considers us his friend. So this isn't just, think about in terms of the community of friends, which I think is there, but more related to the family metaphor, but he says, think of me as your friend, me, Jesus, as your Nathan's friend. So, uh, if you want to say the truth essence or the, the, the compressed maple syrup version of uh, the message, and maple syrup because they get a bunch of gallons of the sap from the tree, and when they get all done, you get like, you could have, I don't know what the ratio is, but it comes down and you get like one gallon of this really cool stuff to pour on your pancake. So, uh, Awareness of being our Heavenly Father's loved children and our Savior Jesus' intimate friend should influence everything about our lives. And I know for me that has not been the case. Thankfully, more and more it is becoming the case that I am more and more able to see Christianity, my relationship with God, my involvement in the community of God's people and also in the world through the lens of the relational nature of Christianity, that we are essentially to see ourselves as part of God's loved, intimate community of children who are the children of the loving Heavenly Father. And as Jesus, you could just say, best friends with Jesus, best buds with Jesus. Um, 
It is not unlikely that in this passage that we're looking at that talks about uh, family and friends, that in regards to the friendship part of the metaphor, that the concept of being a friend of Caesar might have been behind John's thinking when he presented uh, Jesus as our friend. And in the days of the Roman Empire, if you were declared to be a friend of Caesar, that was a lifetime honor, never to be lost. And what it meant was, like, you know, you can imagine for us maybe the President of the United States or something like that, but if you're considered to be the friend of Caesar, and how much greater is it to be than the friend of Jesus, the coming king, the lion, as Gary shared with us earlier, and the lamb, to, to think about that, that you can come and like, if, if Caesar's like in a meeting or something, and you, you show up, the, the guardian of the gate, the, the, the chief of staff, or whoever like lets people have appointments or not have appointments, come in or not come in, if you're a friend of Caesar, guess what you get to do? You get to come in. Anytime. If, if there's something that you ask for from Caesar, and there's literally any way that he can possibly do it, he will do it. Because you're his friend. You're a friend of Caesar. And so I think in a way that we often probably don't even consider the possibility, there is much more available to us relationally as being a part of the Jesus movement, being a child of God, a friend of Jesus than we can, we can possibly imagine. So that's what we're going to look at today. And first of all, we're, going to, we're just going to do it in two big chunks. One is uh, family, and the other one is friend. So uh, first of all, when we trust Jesus in love, Jesus makes us a part of his family. We're not just in a, in a list, you know, a long list of people in the book of life that when we die or Jesus returns, he goes, okay, do they go in or do they not go in? It's like, I don't know these people, but it's like they're on the list, so let's let them in. No, you're part of the family of God, dearly loved. So, for example, John in 1 John 3 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. In Ephesians 2, Paul says it this way, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints, which we looked at that metaphor already, and then he adds the family metaphor, and members of the household or the family of God. Uh, in John 15, which is the main passage we looked at, and we're picking up literally where we left off last week in verse 8 of John 15, where he talks about there the vine and the branches and how we're connected to, to the vine, Jesus, and we're the branches, and we have to get our energy, our flow, everything that we have to produce that produces fruit, which means literally character transformation, or the changes that God can literally make possible in our lives through our connection to Jesus, and disciple-making impact, the influence that we can have on other people for God, both those who don't know Christ to come to know him, and those who do know Christ to grow and mature, somehow tied into our relationship with them and our influence and our involvement with them, which is directly correlated with what God wants to do in their life anyway. He just wants us to be a part of it and enjoy being a part of it. So he says in verse 9 of chapter 15, I'm not going to go in order because I, I, I think it's, better to, to kind of grasp these. I'm doing the left hemisphere part now. We're breaking it down, and then hopefully at the end we'll, we'll get to seeing the big picture. But we're a part of Jesus' family. So he says in John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, and Jesus is talking to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and went to the cross the next day. These are like the most important last things he wants to tell them. John 15. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. My dearly loved children, abide in my love. And so the abiding that he talked about in terms of a vine and a branch getting its nourishment from the vine, now he kind of transitions using the same word, but now it becomes part of like a family connection rather than a, like a garden connection. 
Um, I'm reading a book now. In fact, I just finished it last night called Waiting for Heaven. I ordered 10 extra copies for anyone in our community that might be interested. Presented it to the men's group on Thursday and to someone else that I came in contact with since then. And there's four left <laughs> over here. If you're interested, we got them for like 33% off. But for $10, if you're interested in reading Larry Crabb's latest book called Freedom from the Incurable Addiction to Self, Waiting for Heaven. So and his premise is basically that the more we understand what God has prepared for us, in the future, the more focused energy we will have to journey through the life now in a difficult world, which he says, in this world you will have trouble, with a focused motivation to, I would say, embrace what all these metaphors mean in terms of what it looks like to live that way as we journey through life. So Larry says, uh, he's a friend of Jeannie and I's, uh, which we enjoy having had that relationship with him for many years. But he calls uh, the exact center of Christianity. He says, what exactly is at the center, the core of Christianity? And he says it's this, which is just the verse I just read. That the love generating joy poured into the Son by the Father is now available to us. The love generating joy poured into the Son by the Father for the joy set before him, he went to the cross, it says, that that joy that the Son receives from the Father, the Son now shares with us, his family members. So that we literally can have what uh, Paul talks about, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, those kind of things. Not by trying hard. I'm going to really try hard. Be patient. <coughs> Doesn't work. You can't be better than you are by trying hard in your own effort. It just, it, that's not how it works. Something has to be released in you so that it doesn't become trying hard anymore. It's almost like you become a different person because of who you now see yourself to be because of Christ, not by making yourself a different sort of person by your own efforts. The Son enjoys a relationship with the Father that as a bearer of God's image, we were created to similarly enjoy. But, as you remember the story in the garden, sin separated human beings from the love-filled community with God that they had prior to the fall. Now, thanks to the Son's obedience to the Father that took him to the cross, and thanks to the Spirit's ongoing work in us to turn our inward affection outward towards other people away from ourselves and uh, another of the central focuses of Crab's book is that our key problem is addiction to ourselves always thinking in terms of how is this going to work for me what, what do I want how can these people function so that my life is better and it can be very subtle but basically we're always running through the grid of how does this work for me or what's, what's in this for me and that as, as the, the love of the Father through the Son comes to us and the joy associated with that, we literally can now start outflowing or bearing fruit that we genuinely do care for other people and want to do what is in their best interest, not just what works for us. So as we grasp that I am now committed, I am now included in God's community, God's family, I can experience a taste of what Jesus knows in his relationship with the Father. I can now live fully aware of being God's well-loved child while I wait for the completion of his larger story plan so that I do not demand that everything in my life now be comfortable, resolved. I didn't know if I should share this, but I'm pretty sure they're not online right now. But Jeannie's mom was uh, in the hospital because of her hip, and you heard that story. Um, Jeannie or her dad was with her almost all the time unless she was asleep while she was in the hospital. Then the doctor ordered up to 20 days of rehab at this rehab facility, which was an excellent facility. And Jeannie and her dad, primarily Jeannie, worked out all the details, found the best one available, and it's like, so that day, last Monday, 
she's going to go to the rehab facility from the hospital. And uh, they were with her, take her, take her to the door, but at the rehab facility, you cannot have visitors. In the hospital, they were literally like holding her hand, talking to her, present with her at all times. And so the nursing staff was, was you know, assisted by this, <laughs> this enablement by family members being with her. But it's not allowed uh, in our current uh, situation at rehab facilities, as Tom knows and others who have gone to this route. He can't have him. He surely can't go there to see him. Can't be with him. So anyhow, kind of okay Monday afternoon. She's going to, you know, says she's going to cooperate and everything. Tuesday morning she wakes up. Jeannie talks to the staff about 6.30 before the shift change. She's doing okay. And then she starts getting calls, 7, 7.30, whatever. The doctor in charge of the facility, the, the head of the nursing staff, the, the head of the whole facility, you know, it's like, can you, like, help us out here? It's like, your mom is not cooperating with us. She's not signing the release to, to have any therapy. We can't do anything with her until she signs. Or her husband comes in and signs. So she didn't talk to her dad, and that's okay, so it all worked out. And, uh, Eugene's going to go and sign that. And in the meantime, she's calling everyone in the family. And, you know, if you really love me, <laughs> you will get me out of here. I'm going to be dead in a half an hour if you don't show up. <laughs> but, uh, so it was really hard. Now, we could say, if, if we're walking with God and we love Jesus and he loves us, stuff like that won't happen. What are we doing wrong? Right? Aren't godly people supposed to have like good experiences when their elderly parents start experiencing some of the things that happen when you start having memory issues and stuff like that? So, or we can say, even this, God will su supply the wisdom, the patience, the fruit of the Spirit, the strength to journey through it in a gracious and kind and loving way while praying for mom or whatever. So literally, she talks Eugene into signing her out. By the time, we're two hours away. So on Tuesday, um, after having gone five days in a row, two hours there, two hours back, you know, while mom's in the hospital and all that. Now Tuesday, she can't, she's thinking, okay, I got a day off, because, you know, because mom's in a place where I can't go visit anymore. And so we start getting these calls. So we say, you know, we're going. And, and I hadn't gone down on the other days, but I just sensed the way things were going. She needs, like, her partner, her, her friend, her, her buddy to be with her. And so we drive down there about halfway down. We find out, you know, Eugene signed her out, basically. Gets the doctor's orders. I mean, literally, we're not even sure at this point if the insurance is going to pay for the day and a half she's already been in there because she's refusing, you know, the, the uh, suggested treatment for what she has. And so then we show up at the house to see what we can do. Now, if we think of, of my life has to go smoothly, everything has to fall into place, people have to cooperate with me, no one can give me, like, difficult challenges, um, or it means God doesn't love me, or I'm not you know, a part of the love family of God, I've done something wrong, what did I do, God, why are you doing this? We're going to miss out on the, I would just say, the enabling and even joyful experience of following Jesus in good ways during difficult times. Which I can just tell you, Jeannie's not here, but she did amazing to basically respond, not in kind, respond lovingly to those kinds of things. So, um, what Jesus says for this to happen is we must abide, abide, remain in his love. And we can go, yeah, that sounds great in theory. What does that look like? Well, that's hopefully what the rest of the message will be about. And I would just say it simply this way. Uh, if you want to say just to say it in words, it still doesn't practically unpack it. But by paying attention to being in union with and sharing Jesus' thoughts, emotions, intentions, and power as we journey through our lives in an abiding relationship in which both parties must be engaged. 
Jesus is paying attention to us, interested in us, wanting us to cast our cares upon him, wanting us to be with him in the midst of whatever it is we're going on. Lamenting is completely appropriate in a, in a committed, relational, loving relationship. It's like if you're having a hard time, the person you love wants to have you share that. And if there's something they can do that, that will help you in that, they're, they're going to they're gonna do that. So then he says in verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy might be in you, and that your joy may be full. So he's inviting us into this joyful experience that Jesus could literally say, for the joy set before him, he experienced the cross. And if all of us who know a little bit about the passion of Christ and what it was like and the abandonment of his friends and the suffering and the mocking, I mean, physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, the father uh, turned away from him so that he might fully uh, receive and carry upon himself all that, that sin messed up that needed to be dealt with for things to be the way we really long for them to be. Jesus, for the joy set before them, for the anticipation of what was going to be the result of journeying through this pain and suffering and struggle, he did it. And we can experience and, and, and be a part of that kind of joy as well. So, it kind of goes like this. The order, and again, left hemisphere, breaking it down into parts, and then we'll end up hopefully with a big uh, holistic picture. Being loved by God and invited into his family community. Peter says it this way, we've been invited to participate in the divine nature. To be a part of the ongoing interrelating love relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. From eternity past to eternity future, they've been continually pouring themselves out for the other. Their essential nature is love. That's why God says, God is love. We're invited to be a part of that, to experience actually living so that uh, in increasing measure, hopefully, as we journey and mature, we are actually pouring out and flowing out love to other people. So, uh, how do we do this? Uh, verse 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Like, it's about rules? Like, what are, what are you talking about? If you keep my commandments, it doesn't seem like what would be the next thing. How do you abide in God's love? Do what I tell you to do. Or that's what we tend to think about it as. It's like this oppressive, negative, Rule, you know, Christianity is all about doing the right thing, not doing what you want to, or what's fun, doing the stuff that you don't want to do that's not fun. That's what it means to be a Christian. And unfortunately, a lot of non believers think that's what it's about, too, because that's kind of how we communicate. You know, it's like they don't seem to have any fun, they don't seem to have any joy in their life. So, uh, but one of the things is to start with is to take that off the table and say, no, he's not talking about keeping commandments as an oppressive or negative or legalistic or rule-oriented thing. So um, don't think of, of what he's saying here as focused on lists of things we must do or can't do or we'll get punished or shamed for doing them. Those types of rules are the kind of rules that uh, the scriptures tell us we have been freed from when we're in relationship, in the family of Jesus, a friend of Jesus. So in my youth days, I'm sure it's different today, but in my youth days, that was a major focus of the teaching of the church I was involved in. It's during my, I really was moving around a lot. So high school, junior high, college years. Um, basically, the primary focus of teaching was the things you're not supposed to do and the things you're supposed to do. You know, if you do these things, God will be happy. If you don't do these things, he's not going to be happy with you. And if you didn't read the Bible, you would have thought God's primary focus at that time was on the length of the hair of the boys and on the length of the skirt of the girls. Because there was such an emphasis. Right? You're sure that every other verse or so, there's probably mentioned something about hair length and skirt length. And if you start studying the Bible then at that time, as I did, it's like, I don't see that anywhere in here. 
and dancing as a no-no, and I actually saw that in there. And it was like, dance before the Lord. It's like, wait a second. When did that come become a bad thing, you know? Like, just literally dancing became bad. Not a certain kind of dancing or things related to dancing. Okay, so uh, the positive connection, I think we can see it this way. God provides the relational context that makes possible obedience as an enjoyable and positive thing. Jesus' defeating of the works of the devil through the cross made possible our freedom from the devil's world, flesh, death, captivity. So we're born with this compulsion to do what we want to do because we want to do it because we're addicted to ourselves. That's basically the result of the fall. It's only through what Christ provides us through the power of the Holy Spirit as children, loved children, that we can start beginning to literally want to do what the other person would be best served by and enjoy doing it. It's possible. So, um, I have some college friends. Um, we have a picture there of my college friends. I think. Those are what they look like, reasonably like they look like. That was a few years ago. But uh, Dave, Raj, Leon, John. Sorry about him not having a shirt on. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, I told you a story before about uh, my experience uh, working at Bill Nash Friday nights. I was a relief night janitor for Bill Nash during my four college uh, years. And uh, after the manager of the Bill Nash came to trust me and thought, I can like, leave my whole restaurant in Nathan's hand and not worry about anything bad happening. He told me one night, because he knew I played college soccer, and often on Saturday morning, uh, not morning, but by 1 or 2 o'clock, I'm not sure when you guys play, Nathan, but uh, if you work all night, Friday night, till like 7 in the morning, and then you have a game like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, there's not 8 hours of sleep in there. I'm just saying. So he knew that. So he said, you know, Nate, if you want to have some of your friends come in and help you, that's okay with me. Just make sure you lock everything up when you leave. And he said, and by the way, there's this food right over here that we're going to like throw out in the morning or we're not going to use again. So you can have anything in this section over here. So, created me, comes up with the idea. <laughs> I'm going to invite my friends to work for me for free. And I'm the boss, and I get to tell them what to do. And they're going to work for me for free and love it. Now, I didn't know if that would work, but I started inviting, and these five guys were uh, the common uh, workers with me. What I quickly learned was uh, any more than two uh, helpers made it go slower. So four people took longer than three people. If I only took one person, it took longer than if I took two people. But if I took two people, I had to separate them. John, you're working over in this corner. Raj, you're working over in that corner. And two of these guys, um, Raj and John, became the most common invited. And it was kind of like I got to pick who I was going to invite to come with me, and I picked them based on how cooperative would they be. If I told them to go work in that corner and work happily and do what I tell you to do, would they do it without complaint, without question, or would they just walk over and start hanging out with the other guy in the other corner uh, because, hey, I'm working for free. Why do I have to listen to what Nate says? Okay, now put yourself as though, uh, I I'm not saying I'm Jesus, but in that situation, <laughs> I'm the Jesus character. I have something that I have in mind that needs to get done, and I literally believe that they will enjoy cooperating with my agenda by doing what I told them to do, when I told them to do it, in the way I told them to do it. And I literally can imagine a rewarding and enjoyable experience for all of us if they will cooperate with me. And a less enjoyable experience if they balk or if they think somehow my motives are less than pure. 
And I'm not saying I had the Jesus purity motives, but I literally wanted them to have a good experience. And I literally I arranged it so that uh, the food was available. And I realized we can't eat when we get to the restaurant. We got to get the work done. Then we eat. <laughs> so the reward comes later. Well, that's how Jesus set his whole deal up. He basically is inviting us to be a part of what he's doing. And some of the stuff he asks us to do, if we think he's got some sort of an agenda that's not in our best interest, we may balk at what he's asking us to do or the commands in Scripture, which there's a bunch of them. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll read them quickly to you. So anyhow, how we treat each other. Uh, I don't know if I read verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love each other. So how we treat each other is inseparable from our relationship with Jesus. When I took people to the restaurant, how they cooperated with each other and with me directly correlated with how good of an experience it was for that evening. If they were like, didn't like each other, or didn't thought, well, why does he get to do that job, and i got to go do this one. And literally what they didn't know is I did the hard stuff. Because it was more complicated and more, you know, you had to like know what you were doing. You had to know where the chemicals were that you are going to throw on the, in the pan to mop the, the floor where they cooked the burgers. And literally there was about that much grease on the floor of those, uh, those restaurants after a day's worth of cooking steaks and burgers and all that. So I'm the guy that has to go in there and cut that grease and figure out how to get it up off the floor so it's the way it's supposed to be. That's what I had to do. And they may or may not have realized I was doing the hard work. And, and I think we need to realize whenever Jesus asks us to do something, he's done the hard work. He's just asking us to... <laughs> he wants to be with us. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to do it as a relational community. He doesn't want to just make everything happen and say, I'll pick the people who get to go with me and be with me in heaven. And rather than involve them in the process where they have to choose whether they're going to cooperate with me or not, I'll just make them cooperate. You know, it's like there's no choice in the matter. What kind of relationship would that be? There'd be no freedom in that, no joy of relationship. So that's what he's inviting us into. Uh, so he says in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants. And now we're going to transition quickly at the end, which is very related to the, the second big one is uh, we're a friend of Jesus. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have passed on to you. So, um, two friends of God in the Old Testament. Anyone know who they were? They were called friends of God. Abraham, Moses. So in James 2, this is uh, what we get. Abraham believed God and it was counted to his righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. He believed what God said and just adjusted his life accordingly. Because we're friends. I, I believe him, I trust him, I'm not going to question him. In 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat's praying to God, and he says this, Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So he directly correlates God's involvement and blessings on the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, based on a friendship relationship that he had with God. So then uh, Moses is uh, the other one, and uh, in Exodus 33, 11, we read that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Then in Numbers 12, Moses' brother and sister come before uh, God and say, how come you're making, giving him special privileges that we don't have? We're just as good as he is. And they were complaining because of the woman that Moses had married, and I'm thinking there, without getting into the details of that story, that his wife uh, that he married when he was in uh, the 40 years as a shepherd, she had died, and now he's marrying uh, a second wife after his first wife died. And they were complaining to God about her nationality, it sounds like, that they didn't like the fact that he married this particular kind of a, a woman from this particular kind of place. So the Lord says to uh, Miriam and Aaron, brothers and sisters, you can say, how, how, how can Moses get special privileges that we don't get? 
He says this, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, my friend. He's faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And here's what I think Jesus wants his disciples to take home. As I was a friend of Abraham, as I was a friend to Moses, and defended them when others were attacking them, so am I to you. So we don't have to be worried if we get attacked by even our brothers and sisters, because we can be confident, we're friends of Jesus, that whatever needs, whatever protection or vindication or whatever is needed, God is able to provide that. So, uh, then Jesus says to the disciples, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And literally, the, the guys that ended up being the regulars on my Bill Nash crew were my friends, even so that when I have, like, memories of college, do I remember, oh, I remember that one class, that lecture on the third uh, section of what I did. I don't remember that stuff, but do I remember those guys, and do I remember working with them at Bill Nash and sitting around and enjoying community together after we worked hard to clean up the restaurant, and then we got to go out and get some of that food out and enjoy it together and just tell stories? It's almost like when I imagine what heaven's like, it's like that kind of experiences. Having relational community with people that you have no issues with, who you feel like are literally your friends, your your brothers and sisters in Christ, those that you've gone to war with, if you want to say it that way, without having any agenda against each other, any jealousy with it, just community, love, relational connection. So when I get together with people from my college days, it's, it's those guys. So he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your future fruit should abide, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you these things I command you, so that you will love one another. So, throughout this, the, the outflow of both the family and the friend's metaphor are, if you're my friend, Jesus is saying, you need to be each other's friends and family. You need to treat each other in the same way that I treat you. The fruit of my friendship and family connection with you should be your relational connection with each other. And he says, greater love, verse 13, I skipped over verse 13 to come back to it. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then in 1 John he says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And he doesn't just mean males. He means family members. Those that we are now in family with through our connection to Jesus, we should be willing to lay our lives down for them. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So, some of you know a few years ago, I got fired from a job as a pastor of a church. So how does this friends and family thing fit into that? Well, uh, a couple pictures I want to show you. Uh, this is, these are our friends, Jim and Jenny. It just so happened that in the midst of everything that was going on, we were on our way. Uh, we actually had a, a very uh, challenging retreat, from my perspective, on a weekend. And then I preached, actually did a wedding for a neighbor, then preached, went on vacation, stopped at their house on the way down, stopped at their house on the way back, and then came back, and literally the last day of my vacation, before I ever came back to work or had any further conversations with anyone, I got fired. Those conversations with these two friends and their uh, family and friend response, basically, 
They told us this. Figure out what you want to do, and we will support you. They didn't even have to know the story. Just based on the way that they knew us, the family and friends connection we'd had over a number of years, they said, okay. And it just so happened that they're in a position where they could do that. <laughs> you know, it's not like, well, how are you going to do that? <laughs> We knew that they could, and I didn't know what it was going to look like, and they didn't start it right away, but they did help us start the ministry we started called Start Where You Are. They were significantly involved in that. But I can tell you this, just knowing their loyalty and their faithful support, the biggest issue isn't what is actually happening, it's what you think could happen if other things don't happen, like... Where am I going to work? How am I going to have an income? All those kind of things. Just know, I've got a friend somewhere who actually has some pretty good resources that if it came down to it, says, just tell us what you're going to do and we'll, we'll get on board. Well, that's kind of nice to know. Jesus is telling us, all of us, that, just so you know. Like, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. You know, he wants us to feel like the resources of the Almighty God and the relational connection and friendship that we have is available to us no matter what happens. So another picture. These guys will be familiar to you. Um, uh, Joe and Gary, neither one are, are here. Uh, hi to you guys if you're uh, out there on Facebook. So uh, when the as the time went on and as it came out, months later, you know, as the story played out, there became this idea that maybe uh, it would be a good thing to start a new church, a community, and some people have been praying about asked me if I would consider being a part of that. I didn't know if I wanted to do that or not. And so then over time, long story, but um, it happened, and we're here today as a result of that. Well, these two guys have been, I think, throughout our whole eight-year history, one or the other of these guys has been the, the chairman of the, the elder board. And what's interesting to me is how close they have become as friends. So Jesus is their friend. They're part of the family with me and me with them. But they're friends to each other so that literally Gary, who's like a picker, uh, so to speak, <laughs> You know, he buys stuff, finds deals, you know, he'll say. And he knows his friend Joe, as my grandson uh, Bryce says, Papa, do you think Joe can fix anything? And I said, yeah, I think he probably can, actually. <laughs> and, and Gary knows that. So Gary will buy stuff that's not working, knowing that he can call on his friend Joe, who's not going to go, what are you doing, taking advantage of me? I mean, you're going to buy that and make money off of it, and I'm going to be the one that fixed it? You're taking advantage of me. That's not how it is at all. Joe loves fixing stuff so Gary can sell it and make money off of it because they're friends, because they're interested in each other, because they care for each other. And we need to, I guess, picture ourselves in relationship with God that Jesus loves us, we're his dear children, that he can't imagine wanting anything but our best, and that he wants us literally to go beyond that and think of ourselves as his friend that have special privileges because of the friendship that we have with him. So on that, I'm going to close. I just want to encourage you to start reading the, the commands in Scripture, not as uh, these oppressive, dutiful, list-keeping types of things, but as the instructions that the, your friend and the person who loves you is giving you because he knows how life is and, and what reality is like and what will be most helpful. And he's telling you, like, guys, you need to work on different parts of the restaurant <laughs> until we're done so that we can really enjoy, we can get done quicker and we can enjoy that community time together. And if your buddy Nathan tells you that that's the way you need to do it, you don't balk at it, you don't question it, you don't like go, oh, what's he telling me to do that for? He doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me, he gets a cushy job. No, you go, okay, let's do it, let's get her done. And I can't imagine what good things will happen as a community of God's people, both here and universally, would live and function with a 
just this flow of, of awareness of being loved children and dear friends of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for this uh, very powerful set of metaphors that fit together. May we embrace and live out of the relational reality of being in your family, being your friends, having the very power of God available to us. We can participate in your divine nature and experience being a part of your love and joy and all the fruit that come from, from obeying you and looking forward with awesome anticipation to the great thing that you have in store for us after our work here and our lives here in this difficult world that is still so uh, damaged and affected by the results of sin. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's good being with you again today. We'll see you next week for the last in our series, uh, The Race is the metaphor for next week. God bless you.